Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Pearson's Literacy Author Webinar Series. My name is Jamie Downey, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing for Elementary Literacy. Our goal with this webinar series is to help educators and students alike adapt to the challenges of distance learning. We've assembled a dedicated team of authors and experts to share best practices, strategies, and resources during these unprecedented times. We're so excited to have Dr. Frank Serafini here today to share with you some best practices for teaching during times of transition. Dr. Frank Serafini is a professor of literacy education and children's liter literature in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. He's an award-winning children's picture book author and illustrator and received the Mayhill Arbuthnot Award from the International Literacy Association as the 2014 Distinguished Professor of Children's Literature. Recently, Dr. Serafini was awarded the 2019 ILA Dina Spieldelson Research Award. Dr. Serafini has been conducting research on visual and multimodal literacy, working with contemporary picture books to support young readers' comprehension. He's also developing a visual literacy curriculum and has been investigating digital and mobile applications in literacy education. Dr. Serafini is also an, also an author on our newest K-5 literacy solution, My View Literacy. He is also a well-renowned and well-respected teacher educator who has wonderful insight on our topic today, That's Not What I Learned in School, Tips for Teaching in Times of Transition. Before I turn it over to Dr. Serafini, I have just some quick housekeeping items to mention. Each of you should have a control panel that looks like this. At the end of the presentation, you'll have a chance to ask some of your burning questions. Since there are over 400 of you in this session today, your lines are muted. However, you can type your questions into the question field at any time, and Dr. Serafini will do his best to answer as many as he can at the end of the presentation. To ensure you're connected to audio, check the audio section of your attendee panels to ensure you have computer audio selected. I've also put the call-in number in the question field in case you can't connect to audio via your computer. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Therapy. All right. Let's see. All right, are we good to go? Can you now see the screen? We sure can. Looks great. Okay, let's get started. Thank you um, to everybody out there who's joining us. Um, this was an interesting request. I don't know if anybody has the insight to answer what we're supposed to be doing in these, well, we'll call them times of transition. They're just really weird times. But I want to um, first start by thanking uh, Jamie Downey for putting this together and all the people at Pearson. I appreciate your support. Um, but mostly I'd like to thank everybody who took time out of their schedule to uh, join us and to be part of some thoughts. And uh, I think that's probably the best we can do at this time. Um, I want to be sure you know that I put all these things that I'm sharing with you in the slide into a handout and another full page of some online resources that I am recommending. And Jamie will make those available um, after, after the webinar as well. Um, so let's let's kind of think through this a little bit. Um, first, this is a unique situation, and I think it's important that we start right there. That this is, in fact, um, very unique, and no one has has done this, and this is not something we have experience with. And I think it's important that we think about that way. The other thing I think is important is we realize that this was not a choice that parents, teachers, or anybody made. We didn't decide to go online with preparation. We didn't decide to stay away from our classes and shut them down. And we're in a reactive mode, not in a proactive mode because of that. Um, it's also important to know that teachers are some of the most social animals I know, that it's not natural for teachers to not um, spend time clo in close proximity to their students in general. And I think this is a hard thing for a lot of teachers. I know 
even in my own situation with my undergraduates and my children's lit class, trying to chat with them through Zoom and Canvas is just not a natural thing for me to do. And I also think from reading a lot of the Twitter feeds and some of my favorite people in the online world, they're making the case it's really important that creating the online course or curriculum for getting through the rest of the year is not the same as planning for an online curriculum. And a lot of us were thrown into this situation without a lot of forethought and just said, you have to use some of these tools to get through the end of the year. And I think it's important that we realize that's the situation we're in um, and we have to react how, what do we do um, because of that. It's like this, we've gone from chalkboards to tablets really fast. And I think that this um, has created a lot of angst for a lot of teachers and uh, certainly for a lot of professors as well who were not comfortable or set up in their own minds to do this one. So everyone is confused and everybody is uncertain. And uh, I think we've, I think it's been difficult. Um, a lot of us um, working from our homes and for a lot of different reasons. Um, children are confused and there's been some interesting writing on how to talk with kids about this and teachers are confused and parents are confused and I think it's important that uh, communication become uh, the big key for us right now and overwhelmed. Um, I found a couple cartoons I thought really work well. The first one is uh, uh, this one where you now have 736 new messages in your inbox every day and the one that really kind of caught my eye was this one here. Um, is it possible to work from home and do homeschooling with your kids at the same time during it? And I, when I first saw this, before I saw the joke, I wanted to know who was in the yellow, um, but obviously we're all in the same boat and trying to do this is, is absolutely impossible. So I'm gonna start by asking yourself this question. Are we just trying to get through the end of the year and maintain some semblance of reality? Or are we trying to use this opportunity to possibly prepare for fall? And I say this because I mean it in this term. If you're gonna just try using something online that after the end of the spring semester is over, you probably would never use again, I think that's a mistake. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's better to think about what is a possible um, online resource or tool that you might think about using in the fall and now you kind of get a chance to give it a run without a lot of expectations for being perfect. And I, I think that might be a good way to think about the time we have between now and the end of the year. Of course, we're not given any guarantees that we won't be in a similar situation come fall semester either. We're, we're still waiting at ASU to find out whether we'll be online again in the fall. So. I think using this uh, as a moment to, to learn about some tools to go forward rather than just trying to survive might be a good way to go. Um, I started thinking about some assertions, some things that I think are important to realize. And the first one was that <laughs> when parents are starting to get mindless worksheets, they weren't any better when we were all together. And I think that this situation for some parents that I've talked to and have, have contacted me, has exposed some, some possibly poor pedagogical practice in classrooms. Um, the one thing for sure that's been be, become more visible is the inequalities across schools um, as to resources and, and online access. And this one has certainly been exacerbated by our situation. And uh, I don't wanna go further down that road, but it certainly is more visible. Um, one size fits all, and that seems to be the situation right now, um, that we're going to put everybody in the same program, do it the same way uh, for a whole school or district or possibly state, isn't seem to be working in this round. And the next one is one that I kept hearing from, from parents uh, that they were being told what to do and being told what, to, what they had to send in the morning. And, um, I think we would make a big mistake if we're not asking parents for what we can do to support them at home um, more than telling them what we need them to do. I think that's really important. And going forward, I hope we learn that lesson really fast. Um, the next idea is that without a doubt, some, even, even some of the really young kids, uh, fifth, 
uh, five-year-olds, uh, first graders, they need time to see their friends. And so I know a lot of classroom teachers who've just turned Zoom on and let the kids talk to each other. And I think if you have that sort of technological capability and kids can uh, log on, um, I think that's been very successful for a lot of kids. They've really enjoyed that. Um, from the university perspective, the lectures that I see, um, sort of a sit and get lecture, um, don't get any better in online. I've also learned that meetings don't get better when you do them in Zoom either. Um, so uh, I'm thinking that uh, we've got to think about what are those tools that we can use to be more interactive rather than just lecturing. Um, the one that I, I'm going to kind of stake my ground is that there was a lot of uh, research out there on whether homework was effective and effective in doing what. And um, I think that, it, that some homework was possibly minimally effective. We had kids in school every day. Um, and it's certainly not better now. Uh, and, and I think that homework needs to be something students can do. Um, there's a lot of parents that I've heard from that have talked about being overwhelmed with amounts of busy work during the day that where, where you know, an eight-year-old is spending four and five hours in front of a computer screen, which is, which is not good for anybody. So, as I'm thinking through this, I think that one of the big keys, and I know that we're a little bit farther down the road, this probably would have been something we could have done right away, but I wouldn't have been prepared like many of you what to do, that communication is key. And that one of the things that we should think about is um, understanding the context of, par of parents and students and find, sending home a survey to find out what do you need, what can we do. I'm hoping many of you have already done that. And then setting reasonable and negotiated expectations with parents for what we expect them to do, what we expect us to do, what we're able to do. Many of you have children of your own and parents have jobs at home. Um, what is reasonable and what is, uh, and let's negotiate what we think that is. Um, offer of maybe an FA frequently asked questions list on your website if you have one or send these home to parents that what you know about the situation. College students, uh, even though they're obviously very capable in college, um, really appreciated my weekly messages and uh, every other day messages about what was due what we were doing, where we were headed so that they could keep track. And I know they were trying to juggle four and five other classes as well. Um, setting up lines of weekly communication. Um, I'm going to show you a, an example that I'm hoping more people take up um, and sort of this morning meeting. I, I don't think um, children should sit on computers for six and seven hours a day watching someone talk at them. And so here, this is a possibility that a couple teachers that I know have been trying to do. They've been setting up where possible through Zoom or Google Hangouts or some of the technologies that have become rapidly available, a way to connect with as many students as possible each morning from a variety of locations. And during this time, and a lot of teachers have gone 30 to 45 minutes with this time, um, some have read aloud or they've had an author, um, a ta author's tape, videotape, read to them. Um, we've sent up these morning messages to share resources with parents and students. So not only were the students there for the morning message, parents were involved in some of them. Um, creating online portals for things you endorse that you're finding that you think are worthwhile. Um, part of the morning meeting um, was giving students an opportunity um, to talk with each other. Uh, I think that is really important as well. Um, let students share what's happening at home, what they're going through. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, emotional support needed at this time, as well as educational and academic support. And are we um, giving students enough time to uh, talk about what's going on? The, the next thing I found was that emails um, work fine, but my students, even at the college level, really appreciated my brief video messages, um, revisiting instructions, and supported by an email through a screen sharing app like Camtasia or Jingo or 
QuickTime. These things that just capture your face in a little screen like this with your message or your weekly instructions, daily instructions. It seems like a lot of my students enjoyed seeing it as well as reading it. So um, that one seems to have been uh, a good suggestion. Um, next we have a possible daily schedule. I was thinking about if I was sending home notes to parents about setting up a day for them, what would be reasonable? Um, and I, I think that there's a lots of uh, variety and flexibility here. Um, a morning meeting, uh, let children read aloud or watch or read aloud um, online, or if parents have a moment to read aloud to kids, I certainly want to keep that going if we can. Uh, maybe the morning is a good time for an hour of independent reading or a half hour of book exploration or um, whatever we have time for. And then maybe some uh, social media uh, for sharing ideas. Maybe we can set up, you know, a Slack line or a Twitter line or a feed, different, different kinds of uh, wiki sort of uh, technologies for kids to share with each other. Um, I know a lot of young kids aren't on Facebook and Facebook pages and things like that, but um, even through our own Zoom and Google Hangout, some, some chance for kids to uh, talk with each other. Uh, obviously, I, I think it's important, and I know that we've tried to do this here at home, and we watch a lot of the neighborhood um, is out more, it seems, the last few weeks than we've seen. I know in Arizona, the weather's been pretty lovely, but um, get, let kids get out and run around, even if it's in a small space. And I, I think that, uh, obviously, only if it's safe, you know. Um, uh, lunch something to eat connecting with friends possibly maybe let kids facetime with some couple kids or something and then maybe in the afternoon a, a do something or learn something project and i'll show you what i mean by that in a second but uh, for me you know we can include math and science in those do something learn something projects but I, i'd be i'd be kind of short to go way beyond this in the day i, I don't think kids need five steps of worksheets in the morning. I don't think they work well in school and I really don't think they'll work well at home. And so I'm definitely erring on the side of less is more than more is less, I, um, I guess. So I started thinking about these educational spaces, places where we teach, and I had done a workshop on this. And it was interesting because what happened was we have sort of physical, social, and virtual spaces. And immediately when schools were shut down, we lost these two. And I started thinking, would virtual spaces be enough to support the other two? And I, I, I don't think that they're doing it all that well, um, but I also know that this is all we have in some situations. And so, Presentations seem to be work pretty well through uh, some of the technologies that teachers are comfortable with. Um, we're pretty good at putting our faces up and recording a message or recording a lecture or sending kids uh, a read aloud online and uh, it goes one way pretty well. But interactive and collaborative spaces seem to be a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, we're certainly, uh, archiving a lot of the Zoom recordings and meetings. I'm not sure for what, but I think that there's some uh, interest there. I also think that a lot of children, especially older, I know that this was set up for grades three through eight, and um, but all children, but a lot of kids have their own affinity spaces and social media sort of connections. And I think that um, playing video games uh, should be part of the time. I, I don't think it's necessarily um, something they should do for eight or nine hours a day, um, but I don't think we should keep kids away from these spaces, uh, communicative and affinity spaces for things that they're interested in. So this seems to be what school looks like these days. Um, it's not what it was in, in the classroom where we had other types of spaces. Um, and I think that uh, these technology enhanced spaces um, can be used in a variety of different ways. 
And I'll share with you in the next few slides um, some of my favorite um, educational and technological um, applications and things like that. So these were what we did in classrooms, right? We had boards and whiteboards and document cameras, and now we're challenged to do some of these things in, in thing. And, and of course, the one that's the most dominant is Zoom and Google Hangouts. And so um, every meeting that I've been on in the last few weeks has been through this. Um, it looks like this. Um, I actually had to, this is from one of my graduate students, uh, defended her dissertation um, over Zoom, and we made nice background celebratory when she was done. But it certainly wasn't quite the same as being in the room to celebrate the hard work that she had put in. So if this is what it looks like, and this is all kids are seeing, I think it's going to be challenging for a lot of them. Um, I'm working with uh, a couple kindergarten teachers that are just meeting with their kids on Zoom for about a half hour in the morning and a half hour after lunch and trying to provide resources for parents to take over for parts of the day, but that's assuming that parents have time um, to do this. And I don't think we can do that right now. And so I started looking at some of the collaborative space uh, technologies that we have available. Um, and I've used some, I, I use Goodreads, I've used a lot of the inter, um, interactive whiteboards and things like that and Slack. Um, but I also know that this takes and requires a little bit of technological expertise. Um, I've compiled a large, a large selection of these for you um, on my website. So that last resource down there will show some of the resources. And of course, the, the list changes so rapidly um, of what's working and what's not working that, you know, take the list as a grain of salt. I tried to keep it updated. So these are some ways to work back and forth with students. Um, I started thinking about everyday things to do, right? What can, what is it we would like children to try and do every day? Um, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, hesitant to be prescriptive and say all kids must do these things because there's a lot of variables involved with this, but I started thinking that that some of the things I would hope that kids would be able to do is uh, read for an hour, maybe talk with someone about what you're reading, uh, either through Goodreads online with the person in uh, real time or through uh, some sort of face-to-face, -face, uh, Skype, FaceTime, Zoom. Um, have children write something. I think that uh, there's a lot of things to write about. Um, an isolation scrapbook was one thing I know some parents were doing. Some other parents have been doing uh, public service announcements and posting them. I know that uh, there's a lot of things being written about the situation we're in. And certainly I've not seen a lot of children's voices about the things that the situation um, we're in. So maybe there'd be a way to to organize some of uh, students writing on this. The one that I've really become quite fond of, uh, especially during my morning walks and exercise, is listening to a podcast. And I compiled a set of some of my favorite podcasts for children. You'll see that on the next slide. And um, a, lot, a lot more families have access to an iPhone or a, an Android a phone than they do computers at times and possibly um, podcasts that uh, a lot of people could listen to through a small speaker or just one at a time with headphones, I think might be a good, good thing to reach out. There's some great academic podcasts and just sort of general interest podcasts um, for children. The next thing I was thinking about was just what I'm calling a Learn 10 Things project, and I'll share with that in just a moment. Um, I'm going to, you know, talk about getting outside and exercising again, um, and also just relax and watch your place. Um, I know that uh, my wife and I are, have started a large jigsaw puzzle, which has been relaxing in the evenings rather than staring at the television. Um, we've also pulled out some old board games, some old analog board games to keep us from just staring at screens and 
Um, we've enjoyed some of that uh, more than I thought. So maybe family game night is making a comeback during this time. Um, so the potential assignments or activities, and this is in no way a list of must do's, but just some thoughts. Um, the one was to learn 10 things projects. And I used to do this with my students when I was teaching fourth and fifth grade, that they had to pick something. And these weren't sort of the full-blown science projects that required paper mache in six weeks. These were sort of short, informal, learn things. And so just learn 10 interesting things about someone, somewhere, sometime, something, some idea. Um, go in the backyard and learn 10 things about, watch 10 things about the bird that's flying around eating the tomatoes in my garden, something like that. I, I think that uh, children are naturally curious and um, I, I think when, when they've been given an opportunity to learn something that matters to them, that more of them um, do it than don't do it. Um, these are, and this will be on the, the handout that you'll be uh, of, made available to you when we're done, but um, th these are some of the podcasts for children um, that I've compiled and some came from a list in the New York Times last Sunday. Um, and I think that a lot of these are really interesting for kids. And so this might be a list of places to start. Um, these are all sort of, you know, uh, general interest, curiosity, brain teaser, book club sort of things. Or there's a real variety of podcasts here that you might find interesting um, for um, children. All right. Um, I'm trying to pull together some more online resources. And I, as I was doing this, I'm also making the assumption that a lot of the kids you're working with have uh, online access. And I think that right now we can't assume that, but if we can assume that, or we have some access to uh, a, an iPad or a phone or a computer during part of the day, um, some of the things I think have been really interesting that I've looked at quite a bit are the ones listed here. Um, Teaching from Home is a new website that Google has put together, providing uh, a lot of resources um, for parents uh, from teaching from home and for teachers. Uh, the next one, uh, Math in the Wild, is not something that I've used, but a lot of people I know have been enjoying some of the um, natural math, uh, and some of the uh, curriculum that they've put together for ways of keeping math uh, going in a home and outdoor environment. Um, there's been a lot of museums, and I know it's certainly not the same as being in front of the Mona Lisa, but um, there's been some great virtual field trips put together from the Metropolitan Museums of Art, the Museum of Modern Art Library of Congress has a list of these. Um, Smithsonian has some of these available. And so maybe for an hour, um, we let kids go on a field trip um, to their favorite museum or a field trip to their favorite zoo. And there's certainly a lot of um, a lot of resources available for them exploring spaces that they can't do physically right now. Um, backyard science is what it, just what it sounds like. There's a lot of great science experiments um, and suggestions for things to do in science in the backyard. Um, Outschool.com is just a, a list of sort of general um, educational activities, and uh, I think there's a nice list there. Um, Common Sense Media, which is one of my favorite uh, organizations for organizing reviews on podcasts, apps, and media for children, has been putting together a calendar of online events, and you can find out what's going on live and through tape um, from Common Sense Activities. And one that I hadn't heard of that some friends um, shared with me that they were getting some great uh, activities things. Um, is mommypoppins.com. And I just took a brief look through that. And so I'm not, in, I'm not endorsing every activity on any of these sites, but there's certainly um, good and bad out there. And so those are some that I would say you might want to take a look at. Um, some of my favorite, quote, educational apps, whatever that means. Um, I'm not really a fan of flashcard type apps on iPads and phones. I, I don't find a lot of use for that sort of memorize, but there's some interesting apps out there that I've been playing with, both children's 
um, uh, picture book apps, and you'll find a list of my favorite picture book apps on my website um, under book lists. There's, it's a list of my favorite uh, apps that are that are, there. Are some are available, and some, uh, as Apple changes uh, software, some become unavailable, but a lot of them still are. But some other apps are doing different things um, are listed here. And you just have to put these into either the Google Play or Android or the iTunes store to find these. And a lot of them have uh, are free. Some of them are a dollar. Some of them have light and more extended versions. Um, but here's a list of some of the ones that uh, some of my favorites and a few from the New York Times list um, that they were recommending. So um, everything from science, social studies, um, math, all different kinds of social and uh, educational apps, I think, um, might be a good uh, thing to uh, take a look through and find some that you think are worthwhile for both your students and possibly for your own children. Some ideas for staying entertained. Um, I think that that is one thing we're all trying to do. We um, sit outside for an hour each evening and get a chance to talk to some neighbors from quite a distance, but we try to stay entertained and we watched a few movies here and there um, and played a little, like I said, we played some board games and we've certainly been reading a lot, but some other ideas for, for kids, just some thoughts that I might, I'm gonna share with you are, um, here's, a, here's a list of some things that I think you might possibly uh, consider. Um, if you have Lego, we, uh, a friend of mine had a family Lego challenge who can create the biggest, smallest, weirdest, Thing with Lego, they love Lego and they were, um, had taken pictures and posted pictures of some of the things that they had um, made and let some of their friends vote on which one they thought was the best. Um, right now, there's a lot of really cheap and free software on phones, um, on the iPhone especially, and, and through other uh, tablets for making videos. And so maybe making a director and screenwriter and creating plays and acting out plays and becoming sort of a, a documentarian uh, might be interesting for a lot of kids. And certainly the, um, the technology has, been, has made this very accessible um, and cheaper for kids and families. Art projects, you know, uh, my, my cousin has been creating daily art projects. She's quite an artist, but I don't think we have to be all that fancy at it and to help kids find ways to express themselves through art. Um, I have been cooking an awful lot more and because we're cooking here at home, it has to be better than maybe because we're just running through the house. Um, so we've learned a lot about cooking and have bought some great new cookbooks and that has been very entertaining. Um, a new version of solitaire. I actually got an app that has like 60 different ways of playing solitaire. I haven't tried them all. I'm not quite that unentertained yet, but certainly I've tried a few. Um, maybe choosing a book or a genre or an author that everyone in the world might read a different one um, of the same author would be an interesting thing and, and talking about it as you're reading it. Um, years ago, I had uh, endorsed um, through Random House, their uh, uh, online and audio book collection. And I'm still an avid fan of audio books. I listen to them when I'm driving, when I'm walking, and when I'm just sitting out back. And I think um, audio books, and I know a lot of the um, audio books, for example, Apple's books, um, have offered lots of free books right now during this time. So you might be able to download some classics and some non-bestsellers um, for free. So it's certainly worth a look at what they're offering right now. Um, Semi-educational video game, you know, I don't think we want to take away, um, you know, the chance to play Candy Crush from anybody, but we certainly can find other um, video games that might be a little bit more educational. And then, like I've said, we've gone back and tried to learn how to play some old board games and have dragged out Scrabble and a few other ones and Monopoly and um, it's been a lot of fun revisiting some of those games from our youth and so I would recommend that as well. One of the things that became really obvious to me for my students at the university and I'm trying to think of how you might take this up in your own situations was that a lot of the answers and a lot 
of the resources I've just shared with you are about broadcast than they are about personal service. So in trying to prepare for a master's class online in the fall, one of the things I'm going to be offering is just an office hour time where I'll be virtually online and my students can connect with me and talk about challenges that they're having in the class. And I think that there might be a way for us to set this up um, with parents and students that, that are just available every day from three to four um, on a Zoom chat that people our Google Hangout and people can, can enter and talk to us for a few minutes. I think that that might be successful, especially for older kids who can handle that technology by themselves. Another thing is we've talked about morning messages being for the whole group and certainly think that there's ways of doing that. Um, but maybe um, we do just four or five kids in a reading group two or three times a day. And then the, these smaller groups um, online um, might be uh, even more effective than just sort of disseminating information in a whole group. Um, I know that I've been trying to give more feedback to my students on the papers they've turned in because they're not getting it um, in the class. I usually begin every class talk about any assignments from the week before and my responses to what they turned in. Um, but a lot of students are saying they're not getting much feedback from professors and teachers on the work. They're just turning their work in and not hearing from anybody. And I know we're all busy, but it certainly it's hard to keep turning things in and not getting any responses. We all know that. And of course, personal services from creating some sort of social media spaces that kids can tune in to us and share. Uh, and there's a lot of different avenues for that. And of course, it depends on age and capabilities and technology. Um, but if students are already using some of these spaces, maybe we can find a way to set up um, a chat room or something like that uh, on those for our students. Um, just a few more thoughts, and then I'm going to uh, sign off and try answering some of your questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can. But I tried to give you some thoughts at the end here for just moving forward. And I did find a pretty good distance learning survey template that I made a, a link to from SurveyMonkey about surveying parents about the best ways to support them. And that might give you some ideas of what to include on that. I'm sure many of you have already done this, um, but if, if not, it's never too late, I think, to reach out to parents. Um, I think for me, it, uh, what I've done, there's two things. Um, uh, that I've chosen to try um, technology that I'm planning on incorporating into my online class in the fall. Uh, for example, there's, a, there's an app called Visualizer that I've been playing with this week that allows you to turn your iPhone into a document camera so that you can set it up and have it pointed at a book so that when you're reading aloud, kids can see the images. Um, that's just one example of some of the things. And so if I have a choice between choosing a technology that's simply going to help me get through till June and one that I might use in the fall, I think I'm going to go with the one that I might use in the fall. I think, uh, I think th this is a better use of your time. Um, find better ways to communicate. I have seen lots of pictures on Twitter and Facebook of teachers writing messages in driveways to parents and children sending paper airplanes out windows. I've seen lots of different things. And I think it's important to keep communicating with parents and caregivers uh, in the same way. Um, on that same vein, I think there's a lot of ways of being creative. I saw uh, Colby Sharp had posted an interesting tweet about um, a, a teacher who, had, uh, who went on her morning uh, jogs through her neighborhood where her students live we're writing math problems in the driveways and the students had to solve it in chalk and then take a picture of the solution and send the picture to the teacher that evening. Uh, I, I just thought that was fabulous. I thought that was creative. I thought it was very low risk. Um, a lot of students could be successful with that and it was fun and they probably learned something about math and it didn't interfere with their whole day. So I think Right now, being creative with some ways to work, to interact with children and adults, it pays off big. 
Um, don't send home packets of work you wouldn't expect students to do in face-to-face. -face. And if you expect students to do worksheets in face-to-face, -face, you might want to rethink some of those worksheets that we're giving kids. Um, I think that just uh, mindless kind of uh, mind-numbing worksheets that just keeps kids busy is not what parents need right now, that's for sure. Um, and I think one of the most important things that I, I want to share with you is this last note here is that we're all afraid, we're all uncertain, students are handling it, and I think that what's really important is students are going to remember more about how they were treated than what they learned during this time. And I think we have to reach out to them and be emotionally available and caring and sharing. Um, you know, my students are um, uh, going to do fairly well in the college class. Um, and if I had to err on the side of a higher or lower grade in this time, I'm certainly erring on giving them benefit of the doubt given what we're going through. And I think young students need to uh, have the same thing. I think we've got to remember that these are uncertain times and children are just as freaked out as we are um, and they need to be treated with respect. And so I think that's a really important thing to, to think about as we're, as we're moving forward. Um, I found this on a Facebook page and I, I just thought it'd be a great way to kind of wrap up some of my thoughts. Pooh and uh, Piglet were talking and Pooh says today was a difficult day and Piglet asked, do you want to talk about it? And Pooh says, no, I don't think I do. And Piglet says, that's okay. And he came and he just sat down beside his friend. When asked what you're doing, Piglet said, nothing. Only I know that difficult days are like, and I quite often don't feel like talking about it on my difficult days either. But goodness, continued Piglet, difficult days are so much easier when you know you've got someone there for you and I'll always be here for you. And as Pooh sat there working through his head in this difficult day, while he, the solid, reliable piglet sat next to him, quietly swinging his legs, he thought that his best friend had never been more right. And I think that right now, um, we just kind of need to be there and find our own ways of doing it, whether it's bringing some food to someone in the neighborhood or donating a little bit more to a charity or doing whatever we can. I think we've got to just kind of be there, and sometimes the best way to be there is just to sit quietly next to people we care about. So I hope that some of the ideas I've shared with you have been helpful. I don't think anything we can say is going to answer all the questions given all the uncertainty at this time. Um, we're all hoping that this ends safely and quickly, and I wish everyone uh, sturdy times and uh, hope things get back to uh, a reasonable sense of normalness um, as soon as possible. So um, thank you very much. Jamie? Thank you so, so much, Dr. Serafini, for your thoughtful and inspiring words. Um, I think we all feel <laughs> a little bit better. Um, and um, for those of you on, we are, we're going to take questions for um, about the next 10 minutes. So if you have any, any questions, please uh, send them over to us. Um, we did want to remind everyone that Dr. Serafini has provided his presentation as well as the resource document he mentioned. Um, those were provided as handouts for today's session. To access those handouts, please locate the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Those handouts, as well as a recording of today's session, will also be posted to the Literacy Author Webinar Series page. You will receive an email tomorrow morning with your certificate. Um, that will also include the link to the Literacy Author Webinar Series page to access the recording and um, in those handouts. But again, you can find the handouts right now in your GoToWebinar control panel. Additionally, if you want to learn any more about the Pearson Literacy Programs, including free access to digital demo accounts, please go to pearsonschool.com slash literacy. And wanted to make sure to mention that we are here to support you in this unprecedented time and have compiled a number of resources it can be located at mypersontraining.com slash remote learning. No logins or um, 
sign up is required. Now I will turn it back to Dr. Serafini. Um, I, I'm getting just many, many thank you. Um, you know, so engaging, so engaged. I couldn't stop listening to what Dr. Serafini had to say. Um, one question from Elizabeth has come in and asked Dr. Serafini if you could tell a little bit more about the Learn 10 Things project. Sure, they were just really informal kind of inquiry projects and 10 is just an arbitrary number. You could be less than that. Where someone just went out and said, they were, let's say they were interested in, I remember one uh, kid was interested in what a mandolin was. Went out and did research on the musical instrument of mandolin and brought in a picture of one and shared 10 things that he learned about the mandolin. And so I think these are just kind of quick little informal go learn something about something or learn something about someone um, try to find some different resources i think they're pretty informal i i think we do this sometimes ourselves all the time we get caught on a on a, on a google search and we catch up with something that just kind of piques our interest for a few minutes and we go learn something um, nothing nothing more beyond that we did share um, in the morning meeting time in the classroom anybody who had done one if they wanted to share a few things they learned about something and so That was all they were they were pretty informal little inquiry projects Great, Thank you and and dr. Chirpini Christina has written in and said I'm a reading specialist and I'm struggling with meeting the needs of the 78 students on my caseload not including parent schedules and availability. What advice do you have? <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah, man, if I had the answer to that one, I'd have written that book and all retired by now, right? Yeah, no, the numbers are staggering, right? And uh, I'm, I've been lucky I only have 30 students in one of my classes, right? And you have 78 students that you saw uh, on a weekly basis and parents are worried about what you're doing with. And so I think that my, my guess would be if you can find a way of grouping them uh, into small groups and talking with parents in chunks, you can do five groups. If you have to try to meet with all 78 people at once, they need to know what your load is so that they aren't expecting a call every day. Um, I don't think there really is an answer to that. The, the best thing you can do is um, try to give as much information uh, to as many people as you can. Um, I don't think I don't think there is an explanation. I, I you know I have a lot of questions coming to me about grading right now, and I think that should be the last thing that we're thinking about. You know I think we should be trying to create a, a effective learning experiences. Um, in most states, they they obviously postpone the SATs, they postpone all these tests, and so if they can do that, then maybe we can postpone something ourselves, and something has to give. So I understand your your, your, your challenge, and I respect your challenge. I, I don't know what I would do with 78 kids. I would probably be pulling my hair out and I don't have a lot to spare. Um, yeah, I wish you the best with that. I, I, I hope that there's a way of organizing the parents and students into groups so you don't try to do 78 individuals every day. That would be impossible. Definitely a tough task, definitely. And and another question from Elizabeth came in, about, and it, the question is, what are some of the best ways you have found to create assignments that are more interactive? Yeah, um, you know, the, the, the idea of assignment is always a scary thought, right? That you, you create something that you make kids go do and come back and turn it in. And I think, you know, it, that, that um, uh, morning that that math problem in the driveway in some ways was interactive they went out they worked on it and they sent you a picture right and in, in, in minimal way that is an interactive situation for me the most interactive has been with my doctoral class we're all on zoom for the full class period right and so that that certainly live synchronous interaction is is the most coveted but it's not the most convenient and always not possible for everybody so I think if there's a way for kids, especially children that are a little bit older um, in grades where they can get online and post things, uh, websites like Goodreads and kids book clubs for kids and book sharing for kids where they can go in and post 
ideas about what they're reading with each other and get feedback um, probably are the next level of, of interactivity. Um, the other types of interactivities is a lot of kids are at home with siblings, and that might be an opportunity to pull together um, things where they can do things collaboratively as well. Um, the interactive sort of web uh, technologies I listed on that sheet work in very different ways, mostly asynchronous, um, where we don't have to be online at the same time. Um, and they certainly have positives and challenges for each one of those. But, yeah. Thanks. And we have time just for a couple more questions, and then um, we'll, we'll uh, have to shut it down for the day. We we thank you all. I do a, a number of a number of individuals have written in asking about encouraging students. How do we encourage students? to log in and participate in virtual classrooms. Even, you know, even when they have the devices and the computers available that they're, they're just not logging in. Um, what advice do you have for that, Dr. Sharfini? Yeah, you know, it, it, we, we tend to go to sort of behaviorist mentality. We think about punishments and carrots when we try to get them to do something that they may not want to do. And the secret might be having it worthwhile for them to tune in, right? And so we have to ask ourselves, what would students really need to tune into? And the first thing I would say is it has to be short and meaningful. Otherwise, you're right, a lot of students aren't. And even if it is short and meaningful, it doesn't guarantee that everyone's going to tune in. And so if they have an opportunity, um, the teachers that I've talked with, giving students an opportunity to talk with, with their other classmates has made a lot of kids want to tune in. And so maybe ensuring that part of that block of time they'll get the chance to talk or listen to other students might be one way in. The other thing is, is these aren't lessons. The, you know, morning meeting is not a lesson. Lessons should be short little mini lessons, maybe a five minute video about something for kids to go try. Um, I think if you're trying to do exactly what we did in the classroom in an online thing, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So keep it short. Keep it interactive, keep it social, and make it meaningful. What is it that kids need to know right now? Maybe some book talks, suggesting books, maybe some resources, sharing some things. Um, those might be some of the ones that kids might tune into, and then you can throw some sort of lesson in on the hind end of that. But there's been a lot of reports of a lot of kids, especially in middle school and high school, really just not tuning in, and um, I don't know what the answer is for that. Right, that's definitely a challenge. I, I do, um, I definitely want to make sure to mention, I, I have said this, we, we have gotten so many comments about how helpful this is and how thanking you for your wonderful ideas and your great insight. I do, I want to end with a comment from Christine who said, thank you so much for all of your ideas. I work with eight graders and your ideas are wonderful. Remembering your influence at Horizon Elementary in Glendale. So just want to make sure that, that there was Christine on here um, wanted to thank you for your support at, at, at Horizon Elementary. So um, uh, thank you, Dr. Sarafini, for great continuing to, to work. I used to work with Glendale. I taught at Discovery myself for many years. So it's nice to hear from some groups out there. I'm, I'm glad that some of the things I said might be helpful. Um, I still think, remember, it's, it's a better chance to be a better human than a better teacher right now. So make sure you include that in what you're doing. Great insight. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Serafini. Thanks to all of you who attended. Thanks to um, everybody. I, I'm sure. Thank you all. And, and remember, you will receive your certificate tomorrow via email. Um, thank you again for attending. And don't, don't forget to check out additional webinars that are posted on um, the Literacy Webinar Author Series page. Thank you so much. Bye.